Good morning. My name is Richard Spritz. I'm co-PI of the project of developing 3D craniofacial morphometry data and tools to transform dysmorphology. Ophir Klein is on travel and unfortunately couldn't be here at co-PI. Um, and because I have never figured out, maybe someone knows, how to link two different formats of slides in a power, the same PowerPoint projection, be they either different backgrounds or vertical and horizontal, I actually have two sequential uh, <laughs> presentations I have to do. It's kind of strange. Um, and other investigate, and so this project has had a lot of things going on. There's a lot happening, uh, some most great, some less great, as you'll hear. Um, and other investigators on the project are Benedict Halgrimson, Washington Mio at Florida, and um, it was to be Peter Hammond at University of College London, but Peter was never able to get his IRB approvals handled. And in the end, um, we deleted him from the project, which has been a little bit unfortunate, um, but we really had to get going. Um, Oh, wow. oh, oh, okay. Whew. I was puzzled by that. Um, so we have four aims to the project, and this is going to be very much a research and project talk, having given more than a few of these over the years here. Um, aim one is to build a 3D facial scan library of craniofacial dysmorphic syndromes. And nothing like this currently exists, and there actually turns out to be a huge demand for it. People are coming out of the woodworks who are either doing it themselves piecemeal or who want access to uh, scans of people with different genetic syndromes. Aim two is to try, and three, are to try to build better tools to analyze such scans. Um, extending the geometric morphometric toolkit, which is the classical approach to analyzing these scans, um, to enhance discrimination of dysmorphic bases. Um, and the other would be to use dense surface map modeling, an alternative approach uh, to syndrome diagnosis. And really, the ultimate goal would be to, <coughs> in my opinion, to put these two together to make each better than either one alone. Because uh, dense surface modeling uses a few uh, what are called landmarks derived by GM and other approaches to anchor uh, a mask of pseudo landmarks. Um, and we think that there probably are better ways to do this, and we're experimenting with them. And then finally, aim four is to use all of this to develop a prototype automated tool to assist physicians in automated clinical diagnosis of human syndromes, basically to take a 3D picture uh, and feed, as a child comes into a genetics clinic, and the physician would have a list of differential diagnoses before they ever went into the room. Um, and there is progress on all of these fronts. So the initial um, plan, well, the initial plan was to have four main sites recruiting uh, for the facial scan library of, uh, and that would be Denver, San Francisco, Calgary, and London, which, as I said, never got started. Um, and Currently, Denver, San Francisco, and Calgary have enrolled 620 subjects as of yesterday, and actually one of my people was in clinic yesterday, so the number is probably more like 630 today. Um, and that represents 605 cases, and then 15 familial controls. We thought that it would also be worthwhile to obtain relatives, both affected relatives and mostly siblings, <laughs> affected and unaffected, so that we could, in later analyses, look at the influence of uh, familiality on syndrome recognition and discrimination. Um, of the cases that we've enrolled thus far, 216 are chromosomal disorders, and you'll see that's heavily loaded with trisomy 21, which we specifically went after because we wanted to have a few syndromes that are very heavily represented that we could use to build tools that would be robust to age, sex, and ethnicity. Um, and then a smattering of other conditions. Um, so Turner syndrome 4P minus, which I find pretty interesting. There are that many patients readily available with 4P minus, it's pretty rare. Um, 11Q minus, 12P plus, and then 31 others, which in some cases are one-offs, and it's going to be a question of, for, for a lot of these, they are one-offs of syndromes that are known and described, 
In other cases, they're really kind of one-offs of unusual chromosomal rearrangements, and it's a question of how you know, useful those will eventually be, but there aren't that many of them, so we're not worried about that at this point. And then 389 are syndromic, and again, in many cases, we went after a fair number of people with certain syndromes, so we have 33 Marfan, but also this represents who comes to genetics clinics. Um, so there are 33 Marfans, fair number of achondroplasia and pseudoachondroplasia, which are different diseases, um, various ectodermal dysplasias, a lot of other syndromes. And what you can see is that the numbers sort of decrease. And this is only a representation. This is by no means all inclusive. I, I don't know the total number of syndromes represented at this point. I would guess that it's several hundred. Um, and in, in some cases, the very rare syndromes at this point, we only might have one or two. Um, or zero for a lot of them. Um, let me see here how I do this. Okay, so what are the issues? Well, um, there are a couple of issues, actually, I think. Yeah, um, so the enrollment thus far has only been about two-thirds, it's hard to pick up a rate, but about two-thirds or three-quarters of what we'd hoped for. Um, for example, during the month of December, pretty much all clinics are closed for about two weeks over the holidays. That's my least, uh, probably everyone that runs a lab, that's your least favorite time of the year. Um, for those of us recruiting patients, the same. Um, and largely this is because of the loss of London as a recruitment site and because we got, frankly, a bit of a late start because of very protracted IRB and hospital approval processes. I have a meeting um, next on the 21st. Um, with the head of Children's Hospital, not even the IRB, it's something called Children's Hospital Research Organization, because, as she, to use her words, we're being peppered with demands by a lot of different people in different regulatory organizations um, who aren't in communication with each other and we're getting jerked around. So she's going to serve as one point of contact, so if we have to do some sort of uh, uh, amendment, we can just do one. Um, our solution has been that we've been very aggressively adding clinics, um, obviously in Denver, San Francisco, and Calgary at our uh, primary sites. Um, again, regulatory approvals of some of those have been a little bit slow, even conflicting within the same organizations. Um, we have also been pretty aggressive actually adding external sites that are themselves already collecting 3D images of patients with syndromes. Um, reconsenting them for inclusion in free space. So we have, um, actually it's going to be a couple of sites in Denver, uh, Australia, Italy, uh, California. Um, we are very popular at the moment with 3DMD. I'll talk about that in a minute, who makes these cameras um, because we bought, spent a lot of money with them. And they gave us their complete list of all cameras installed in North America. We've contacted all of those people and um, there are currently about 33 of them who are already collecting images of people with syndromes who've expressed interest in depositing them in face space. It isn't clear to me what they really get from it, um, but wonderful. So this is going to take all of that regulatory time, but that's where we are with it. And there are at least two people at this meeting that I want to talk to about that. Um, we have all of our current images have been taken, that is uh, from our three main sites, have been taken using Creoform Gemini cameras. Um, these give very high quality, but they are, require very intensive uh, manual image processing. And we really feel that we need to get rid of that aspect of things. So we've purchased new 3D MD cameras for Denver, San Francisco, and Calgary. Um, order goes out today, I think. Um, and those images do not require post-processing, or very little. And so that will eliminate a lot of hands-on work. Um, we'll still do the hands-on work for the images that we have, but it means that going forward, we can have more people spending more time taking pictures, using the Gemini as a backup if we need them, if we actually have more patients and clinics than we can deal with with just one camera. Um, our a major issue that we're just coming to grips with is that the plan was to only image subjects who have pre-existing molecular diagnoses. That turns out to be impractical because of uh, the pattern of people who go to hospitals in the United States. 
uh, in North America. Most patients who have obvious diagnoses never get molecular testing. The physicians don't view it as important. Um, also, insurance doesn't always cover it. Um, furthermore, most patients who come to genetics clinics are coming for their initial diagnosis, and once the diagnosis is established, they usually don't come back. So recalling those people turns out to require a specific action. They're not going to be the ones showing up in clinics unless they're coming back on their first, on their second visit usually to talk about whatever the molecular testing has shown. Um, so we are having to figure out how to retrofit. What we're doing is collecting the images of people coming to clinics and then retrofitting those images with data that we can get. And currently, um, we don't have sort of a uniform system for that, and I addressed that this week, and we have a meeting coming up where the three uh, main investigators from Calgary, San Francisco, and Denver are going to get together at a ski area and um, hash this out. We're going to have a, uh, a Skype call with all of the people involved. Um, so we're retrofitting images. Um, this also currently requires very time-consuming expert curation meaning me, or another clinical geneticist. It's not something that really can be done by uh, the person who is taking the images, for example. Um, it's hard to follow threads, even with an electronic medical record, as in most places, um, meaning certainly at Denver, San Francisco, and Calgary, the clinical data and the genetic data are not linked in any particular way. They're usually not stored even in the same databases. So it means someone has to, A, get regulatory permission to go into all those databases, and then to retrieve the information and put it together. So that's part of what we're discussing, uh, to what, how to achieve. And uh, I'd like to talk with Carl as to whether this the hub could help in some way in this, if nothing else, to be sort of a repository for metadata that we can all access. Because one issue turns out to be um, we can't we can't allow each other to see identifiers across different institutions, and you need the identifiers to be able to link all these different kinds of data: the date of birth, the medical record number, the name, etc. Um, so that may, the hub might be able to be sort of an independent way to do it. Aim two is to extend the geometric morphometric toolkit to enhance discrimination of dysmorphic faces. Washington Mio is working on uh, extending the automated landmarking that's been worked out for normal faces to dysmorphic faces. That turns out to be very non-trivial um, because the abnormalities themselves interfere with automated landmarking. Um, Mio and Halgrimson are adding Monte Carlo methods that enhance shape discrimination, and Mio is um, building, learning generalized shape metrics and uh, developing hierarchical methods to enhance dysmorphic discrimination. Um, we have a plan to prioritize 32 pseudoachondroplasia images first that will go into the, the hub. These have been specifically requested by Jackie Heck, and she'll have to apply to and obtain them by, from FaceFace. -face. That'll probably happen this spring. Um, I was planning to do it immediately, but we've diverted the person who, people who work on that to working on normal Caucasian faces for another project that NIDCR knows about. Um, <coughs> Aim three is to validate and extend dense surface modeling approaches. That was to be done by Peter Hammond, who, as I said earlier, won't be part of the project. Um, the solution is uh, Washington Mio has begun doing this himself, um, implementing DSM uh, in particular to distinguish vari variation that changes with age, which you really can't get from pure landmark <coughs> data itself. Um, in addition, he's working on something that we haven't talked about, but it's related to a method that was uh, invented by Peter Clace. It kind of merges aspects of geometric morphometrics and their dense surface modeling, um, uh, and he calls it dysmorphometrics, and it is used to discriminate this more or analyze and discriminate dysmorphic faces. Um, but it, uh, Washington is trying to develop a learning uh, method that will actually improve over time using Krusty's uh, scaling. Um, I want to get to the last thing. Um, 
And AIM-4 is to develop a prototype automated tool for clinical discrimination of syndromes. And we expected that this would require collaboration with some kind of commercial entity. It really was pretty, probably beyond our capability to develop something that clinicians could really use. And in the interim, over about the last year and a half, an Israeli company called FDNA, that I'm sure Max Munka is familiar with, um, has produced a free iPhone app called face to gene that clinicians can use to take 2D photos on their iPhones, send them uh, off and refer them to a database, um, and get back uh, a list of likely or the most likely diagnosis, and they can upload images of their unknowns for their private use. And the business model of FDNA is basically to give away service and technology free to clinicians and researchers with the goal of building databases that they can then uh, use to provide an expanded service to pharmaceutical companies. I don't get the business model, but that's what they say. Um, we've been in discussion with Dekel Gelbman, who's president of FDNA, about a collaboration in principle, and it morphs around a little bit, and we're talking with the NIDCR staff about it, but to assess whether 3D might be better than 2D for syndrome discrimination, that's what everybody assumes, um, and to assess whether uh, at least a cadre of 3D images could be used as a basis in combination with 2D to anchor uh, the uh, 2D to provide better syndrome discrimination. Um, and with that, I need to shift to the other slideshow, and I don't know how to do that because these are FDNA slides, and I had to promise that I wouldn't alter them and insert them into my um, presentation per se, et cetera, et cetera. So, that, ah, great, okay. I did delete a lot of them, though. Um, they sent a lot of stuff. Great, thank you. So this, these are FDNA slides. I have nothing to do with making them. I just selected them. Um, so the idea in the, is that they would not have the images per se, although Steve tells me that maybe that might actually be possible, but that they would use data derived from the images um, and use that to essentially salt uh, their other image, 2D image uh, libraries uh, for a more accurate uh, syndrome discrimination. Um, that would be incorporated in this free software they give out, Face to Gene, uh, and would be accessible to clinicians. It would also be available on the hub for research applications and, you know, IP and stuff I don't think is as important. Um, and the idea, their idea is that this would help have clinical utility. And it, it seems to me that this is worth pursuing because in a very short period of time, they've really become kind of the only player in this space. Um, and uh, if they're interested in working with us to do what we thought we would have to work with some kind of company to do anyway, we should at least continue talking with them. Um, basically what they do is you, a clinician inputs an iPhone image, uh, and they do both feature detection and gestalt detection on it to come up with the most likely diagnosis, which they then output back to the physician. Um, I think probably one could do better. They claim to have 95% accuracy in diagnosis. Uh, I'm not sure how they know that, but uh, that's their claim. Um, so they have a clinical tool, they have a research tool as well where you can uh, look at collections of images and analyze them in various ways. Again, these are all 2D images, not 3D images, and so they intrinsically don't have three-dimensional information in them. Um, and they have a network of uh, organizations that they work with that give them 2D images. They have access to the uh, London Dysmorphology Database. And their idea is that the face-based images would be periodically, or a distillate of information from the face-based images, would be periodically available to them to incorporate into their analyses. Um, so their idea is that they would essential, their first idea was that they would basically convert the 3D information to 2D information, which seems to me to lose point. Um, and I've said that to them, and they agree that 
is a ration, a good uh, point that they probably need to keep it 3D. So that's kind of where things are. Um, I think we're now in the state where we really um, need some help from the hub in terms, because we're ready or we'll be ready very soon to start giving you very large numbers of images. And we really need to develop a classification system and a system for attaching a lot of clinical information to those images, which we're consented to share. That's it. Questions? Yes. I wondered if, uh, I know Linda Shapiro. to speak up. Uh, where's the, there it is. I, I, Linda Shapiro, I know, did a lot of this stuff in Face Space One, is, and she delivered a lot of code. Is any of that code useful for some of this non landmark, land, non -landmark based uh, analysis? If you could repeat the question. The question was whether what Linda Shapiro did in Face Space One would be useful. Right. So, what Linda, if my understanding, and Steve, please correct me, my understanding is what Linda did in Face Space One was develop an automated landmarking algorithm. Plus software, well, well, plus software. Uh, she deposited a lot of software in Face Space. I know. Right. We, as did we. So yeah. Washington Mio also yeah. developed an automated landmarking algorithm. The first version of which is also in, has been deposited in Face Space. So since he's co-investigator, we're exploring using his algorithm to expand it to landmark dysmorphic faces. I, I must admit that we I haven't looked at Linda Shapiro's algorithm. I can't tell you whether it would be superior, whether it would work. I have no idea. So, Rich, what about uh, the data you you group produced during phase one on the facial variation, and then uh, how's that going to help with uh, what right. you're doing now? So the question was, can I change your question a little bit? The question is whether the data that we and Seth Weinberg um, put into the hub as part of phase space one, which were, had to do with normals, and in Seth's case, specifically facial norms, um, could be useful, and absolutely yes. So one assumption we have is that those will be the norms against which we compare the abnormal faces. Um, because the, basically, in the project, AIMS two and three of the project have to do with analyzing developing tools to analyze faces, abnormal faces, and analyzing those faces in given syndromes per se, M4 is discrimination of abnormal faces, which is a much harder task. So absolutely yes. And I think um, the idea, for example, of collecting a large number, images of a large number of patients with Down syndrome was that we would have, we would transcend age, sex, but also ethnicity. And I was delighted, because I'm the one that collected them, that there were a lot of African and African American patients at this national meeting. And so we were able to get a pretty good cadre. And though, of course, at the moment, what we have are Caucasian, mostly Caucasian data and African data that came out of Face Space One. That's the reason I asked that this will be a good uh, rationale to clean up the data from before and then working with the hub and it's available. To Trust me, I have, Carl and I need to talk because we're going to be, we're still working with the face based one data. We probably will want to replace certain data sets that are sitting in there. And I was going to ask about if anyone, I don't know if anyone ever asked for any of them or received them, but if you get a data set from dbGaP and the data set changes, you get an email that says there is now a new version. Do you want it? Yada, yada. And we probably need to think about doing that as well. Yes? So is there a goal ultimately to link each particular dysmorphology to a genetic lesion? Because you mentioned that many of these patients, in the end, never get uh, molecular testing or diagnosis. So is there an ultimate goal to do that? Or? So probably won't repeat it. Yeah, the question was basically, can we relate phenotype to genotype? Yeah. Um, and I think that I certainly don't plan in any very detailed way for any given syndrome to try to relate phenotype to genotype. But it's very clear from the response we've gotten from all over the United States and Canada and wherever from people who are trying to do exactly that, that they would love to have the, the, these data out of face space 
to augment the studies they're doing. I think that, you know, so at the gene level, do we plan to do that or I mean, we can't do everything, so the data will be there. We probably will do some of it, but it will be there for other people to do what they want. At the mutation per gene level, I certainly don't plan to do that. Yeah. Rich, um, so Sylvia syndromes presumably have other defects that are not many facial. Are you, how you yeah. annotate, are you annotating those? So that's a really good question, and it's a matter of my time since I'm the one doing it. Um, oh, sorry. The question was, other than craniofacial, where we're going to have the scans and people can analyze them and figure out for themselves what are what are the defects or what is abnormal versus normal in those. Um, what other annotation about non-craniofacial aspects of phenotype are we collecting? And that is a problem. And it's a problem because the person that does it is me, and I have only so much time, and I'm not going to spend my entire day pouring through each clinical chart to pull out every thing that's been seen in a given patient. So um, uh, I don't review all of the charts. I only review the charts that we get back and I am trying to go through them and pull out what as a clinical geneticist I think are the most relevant aspects of phenotype. That means though that if anyone wants to do anything based on that, they're taking my word for it and I'm taking the word of whoever wrote it in the chart, right? And I'm sort of trying to see as I read through multiple visits or whatever what's there. So the accuracy of that is not necessarily great. That's a related question. Some of these syndromes have um, specific dental defects, uh, like some of the eczemal dysplasias. Are you imaging teeth? No. no. Um, if I see hypodontia or abnormal teeth or something like that in the chart, since this is an NIDCR study, that is something that I note. But I'm also doing things, go I'm also going in the other direction. So the person who's imaging is not a physician and not medically trained at all. None of the people I know who are imaging are medically trained. And so when they write down clinical diagnosis, it might be, um, well, we had one the other day, where there was just this long litany of things. It started out just being lysencephaly. And I went through the chart and I wrote down lysencephaly, craniofacial, uh, facial dysmorphia, and a number of other things as I could pull them out of the chart. And as I kept going in the chart, and I found out that there had been a Ray CGH just done, and the child has deletion of the LIS1 gene, and the patient has Miller Deeker syndrome. So I erased everything else, and I just put down Miller Deeker syndrome with facial dysmorphia, because it seemed to me that, from an NIDCR standpoint, was the most useful thing. So I'm probably making or I probably should have put that, had a new column that said miller deeker syndrome and left that long litany of specific things, but I didn't. So, Pedro. Um, this is Pedro Sanchez from UBC. Um, the phase two gene project has really addressed a lot of the clinical needs of people who are trying to track their patients and it has a database of phenotypes that improve their algorithm. So. You know, you do put in other findings of cardiac defect or immune deficiencies or whatever in their database to help them come up with a diagnosis. And then at the same time, it helps you recall that patient a couple years later when you have another kid with similar findings. You want to correlate that. My question is, with, with the face base, a lot of the goal is to produce resources for future uh, research and investigation. And is there a way to partner with face to gene to extract some of that metadata that's coded and anonymized? And would that be able to, if it's through our process and collaboration, um, are they willing to de-identify it and produce it for the hub? Maybe the, I know they have an algorithm for a, a mesh for this identification. Right now, it might be all proprietary. But if it's a true collaboration and supported, um, would they be willing to? I, I met with Deckel once. So I don't know what they'd be willing to do. We are in initial discussions with, I'm oh, sorry, the question is how, what would FDNA be, of what they already have, be willing to give to face space? And I, and I don't know. Um, I know they would be willing to give the, the, their software to face space. Um, 
sounds like they would be willing to give most of their analytical tools to face-based. Um, whether or not they would provide access to the databases that they have and, and use as referent, I have no idea. Not, not existing, but more prospectively. If this is a face-based collaborator, clinical collaborator that we recruit, well, it's not going to be a clinical collaborator that we recruit. They're not, they're not contributing. They don't have, they're not taking any images. They are accruing images, and I don't know what they can share or not. Yeah, I know that the, their, their tool does not take the images itself. It just extracts right. um, metadata. Right. It, it's, it's very, very well designed for people who are concerned about identification. Yeah, no, it, it, it absolutely doesn't use the images per se, but they do have an image warehouse that they use as reference, um, like the London Dysmorphology Database and like. I don't know what, what shareable and what's not. Um, okay, so a quick look. You're, you're merging into uh, a different set of uh, business models here when you when you look at the clinician side of things. So you were saying they use 2D images? They, they is use, who? Uh, so the FDNA. FDNA uses 2D images. Um, so you can twist this just a little bit. There are available software, uh, iPad, iPhone apps, from Autodesk, or the, the AutoCAD people. You can take spot images, 2D images, or you should be able to take a, a video, and you can put that into a 3D model. So this is for 3D printing, but it's the same thing. So when you guys start heading towards that, I agree you should use the high-res 3D images that you're using, but when you think about a clinician, there are, you can use your, your cell phone to make a 3D image from either point <coughs> points for a, for a round video that already exists. So the point was made that the that one doesn't have with a an iPhone, though FDNA is using uh, iPhone images in a 2D mode, that one could generate a 3D image using an iPhone or something like that, conceivably. And so that would. I'm not aware of that, but that would certainly be a, a way that FDNA could take what they already have and just extend it to use 3D. Yeah, that's very cool. That's how they merge to you. That's how the clinician doesn't need a you know, $600,000 camera. So they're not $600,000. Um, they're about 30000 But there are, there's a new generation of cameras. There's a company called Fuel 3D in England that makes a camera that is $3,000, a handheld, it does not have, the, the current model does not have sufficient resolution for this type of application, but um, told they're very smart people who work for Buell 3D and that very likely their version two would be adequate. Um, another issue with that camera is the amount of time it takes to picture to take a picture and the squirminess of little kids, especially little kids with syndromes or who might not be intellectually intact. Pedro? There's a comment from the webcast. Uh, it says a solution to improving recall of patients once the diagnosis is made is to establish a link to the hospital dental clinics. Most of these patients need extensive dental care and it can only be provided in a hospital-based dental clinic. In addition, some hospital dental clinics have the 3D MD cameras, such as ours in Vancouver. Hmm. That's a good thought. So quite, the point was that one place that patients do come back to repeatedly is a dental clinic for dental care, and ongoing dental care, and that that might be a good place to get people who do have established diagnoses rather than only new patients coming in for their initial diagnosis. That's a great idea. Um, I hadn't thought of it, and I'll pursue it. Pedro? I had another question or comment for the Hub, or just a discussion of file types and what we actually produce to the Hub. And in fact, when you take a 3D image, there's one specific file type people prefer. 
and that we've uploaded. But there are also 2D photos that are actually provided from the camera. And so if the hub had a folder for that one patient, it would have also be, been able to, it would be easier to actually get that um, information for this, this type of um, app. Is so there this a, is 3DMD you're talking about? 3DMD. Yeah, so the point was made that 3D image, 3DMD uh, outputs a 3D image, but there's also available a 2D distillate of that image. Um, <coughs> Parenthetically, and that the hub might want to store those as well. Parenthetically, um, what isn't so widely known is that 3DMD images, as using all the default parameters, which is what most people do, um, are very noisy. They, they just have a lot of junk in them because the polygon size. So what, the way this works is that the mesh that's made is made up of polygons and, uh, that are local shapes. And you can vary the polygon size. And it turns out what most people don't know is that that is a user-definable setting. So the default that 3DMD has is quite noisy. Um, it's probably good enough for this type of work. It's not good enough for a GWAS. And that's something that Mary and I need to talk about, um, what setting was used for the GWAS. I, for the Gemini cameras that we've been using, the data are actually all there. You can post hoc reset the polygon size and get a higher resolution, less noisy image. Um, I hope that's true for 3DMD as well. It must be. It, I'm sure certain. that that's, that's um, So, uh, but the default is not adequate, it turns out. So uh, let's wrap that up since okay. we're a little over time, but that was great. Thank you very much.